Welcome everybody. We're so proud to welcome you to our Exponential Digital Ethics series. Uh, we today will focus on cyber ethics in the digital era. I will first uh, want to introduce uh, Dr. Jane Thomason and Mr. Matthew Rosenquist. Dr. Thomason, would you please share with our audience why you think it's imperative for our society in the digital era to focus on ethics? Ethics are the basic foundational principles upon which we run our societies. And the reason they're so important in terms of cyber is the exponential consequences of the ethical decisions that are being made. The speed and the scale of the impact of one decision can get hard coded into a machine and can have consequences for billions of people. So it's vitally important that we think about how we convert something that's traditionally being individual decisions into frameworks and approaches that can be taken up in frontier technologies. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And Mr. Rosenquist, would you be so kind to share a little bit about your experience and uh, what your global insights are regarding cyber ethics and the impact uh, that that it has on organizations as well as the individuals alike. Absolutely. So I've been doing security for over 30 years and working with academia, working with governments, Fortune 100 uh, companies and so forth. And, you know, as, as uh, was previously discussed, ethics is a foundational aspect. Um, it drives your business or how you treat your citizens. And so it has very, very important ramifications. And I think the world understands that. But what we're finding right now is the world is changing and it's changing extraordinarily quickly. This digital transformation where we're embracing wonderful new technologies and devices and services and we're weaving that into our lives every day, that then changes the dynamics and the old viewpoints, um, structures of ethics have difficulty moving into this much faster, much more connected, much more data-driven, individualized world. And so, yes, ethics has always been important, but as we're moving forward now with digital technology touching everybody, enriching everybody's life around the world, it also represents a new risk if we don't look at ethics in a new way that addresses this new paradigm, this digital ecosystem that we are all trying to thrive in. Thank you. And I think that that's a great segue into some of the hot topics uh, we were planning to discuss today. So one of the major concerns that we have, not only from individuals, but organizations and society as a whole, is how do we protect our privacy? And with that, um, we, we have to talk also about digital identity, right? We, we start to share our identity these days in multiple forums and in multiple devices. And the social media has uh, caused quite a lot of uh, attention to many data breaches over the last few months uh, or years, so to speak. So can we maybe share some of our thoughts and, and experiences in terms of how can we safeguard our privacy better and specifically in the context of the digital era, our digital identity and privacy uh, aspects regarding that. Um, Matt, do you want to start us off and then Dr. Thomason right after? Absolutely. So again, we're in, a, we're in an era right now where our identities are digital identities and the digital footprints that we have, right? Where we go, what we buy, who we communicate with, what our political views are, right? That is exploding in regards to the amount of data that's being generated and captured and then aggregated across. So, you know, something as simple as, you know, what you buy uh, on your credit card or who you're meeting, who you're having meetings with today or who you connect with in social media, uh, where, where you browse. Every single web page you've gone to, there's been a, a web browser that's captured that for the most part. And it creates a digital profile. And this is some do. Back in the analog world, it really wasn't possible, not anywhere near this scale. And it's done automatically because we've got all these, these systems and now AI to aggregate everything. So part of the problem is making sure that your identity, as well as everything, all the metadata that's associated with it, is private. So it's only used for what you expect it to be. And everybody has a role. 
each of us individually should be very concerned and careful in who we share that with, what services and products that we use, and whether those organizations are uh, gathering that information ethically and using it. We also have to worry about the companies that, um, you know, as for sh uh, shareholders, are those companies acting in, ethic in an ethical way or will there be potential backlash? And we're starting to see that, especially with the data breaches, but also in privacy and how um, data is being handled or shared or potentially used to manipulate people. And at, moving forward, it's going to become more and more of a competitive advantage. So there's lots of tension in the system. We all have roles to play and there is no single easy solution. This is about discussions. It's about finding that optimal balance between the technology, the behaviors and the processes and frameworks that we can apply to protect our privacy. Thank you, and I, I have to agree. Actually, this morning I was part of an event where we had about 100 some, something uh, participants uh, from all over the world. And it was interesting to see how the opinions are so split and you constantly have a push and a pull and, and concerns regarding the individual desire to maybe have access to, to um, global um, financial inclusion and many other elements that we all strive for. But on the other hand, uh, then you have the, the colleagues who go, oh, wait a minute, if we're starting to, to go down this path, uh, we're opening up a honeypot for, <laughs> for cybersecurity attacks. So. Uh, I wanted to hear maybe, uh, Jane, can you share your opinion and your experience globally as well with, with working with so many international organizations? What do you feel is the pulse and the trend? Well, look, I think it's, it's uh, both vexatious and confusing. Um, I live in a country where people really object to this idea of a national identity and yet at the same because they don't want the government to have their data and yet at the same time they are willingly providing their data to everyone that they interact with and and i think too there's an element of this instant gratification you go on a site you want something that's on that site they're asking you for more information than you really feel like giving them, but you still want that thing. So you give them the information and you've lost sight of what you've just given away. So, so I think there's this kind of bipolar um, relationship that we have with privacy, where on the one hand, we give it to everyone. And on the other hand, we object to government getting access to our data. And we really have to kind of reconcile what privacy means, but it's also an issue around data ownership because this is one of the debates that's going on globally um, is at the moment, probably everyone owns your data but you. You're, whether it's health data, you're giving it to the hospitals, you're giving it to the doctors, you're giving it to the radiology providers, all of your shopping data and travel data and insurance data you're giving freely away. And so people are, are trying to further develop this concept of self-sovereign identity where you own your identity and you own your data and people are devising ways technologically for you to permission people to use it. But at the moment, it's wild west as far as personal data is concerned and privacy is concerned. And anyone who thinks that we have any is deluded and living in a past century. I agree. And, and because you mentioned self-sovereign identity, that's, that's another one that I noticed a lot of split opinions because on the one hand, yes, for certain uh, industries, this is what seems appropriate. But then there are other industries where people say you can't because people can't really give informed consent for certain <laughs> domains within the industry. They don't understand to give an informed consent for, for being able to use their data. And one example I like to always give is uh, genomics, right? Many people, you explain, okay, do you give consent? Yes, I do. They will swear they gave consent to you and they will validate it. But do they truly understand the potential consequences? No. And then, um, I, I agree, I, I see the same thing internationally that even amongst us uh, that are in the digital tech space and uh, considered futurist, we still have a variety of opinions versus uh, from uh, choosing between a federated model or centralized model or completely decentralized. So you have people arguing nonstop. Two weeks ago, we were at the European uh, Union Commission 
And same thing, you had a panel of experts and each one of us had a different stance on how much to decentralize and what to decentralize and what belongs in certain uh, super secure private keys versus public keys and who's going to be the owner of the private keys. So it, 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 the more you talk, the more you understand that there are uh, differences in opinions. There's no easy solution. So Matthew, we have, yeah, go ahead. No, I, I just wanted to raise the issue, and Matthew, I'd be really interested in, in your thinking about this, is that we've been brought up in an era where our social contract, if you like, is with our self-sovereign government to look after these issues for us. We've now moved into an era where our individual country governments can't govern what's going on on the internet. And so how do we move to this new era of global governance when our model for governing is from another era. I'd love well, to hear what you I mean, if, if you look globally, right, uh, there is no single global government. So right now you've got several hundred countries governing their own kind of way. And even in the EU where there's a lot of collaboration, still independent governments and if independent societies have their own perceptions and they may layer things on. So I, I, I don't foresee any time having a, a cohesive strategy plan tool set processes. Um, it will always come down to the individual um, countries, societies, uh, and the populace there to figure out what the right balance for them. And when we look at individual countries, some of them fully expect the government to, to help them and protect them. Uh, other countries, the government is just mandating it, um, and the populace is, is okay with that. And then you have other countries that say, no, 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 um, you know, we want to control our privacy. We want to be the stewards, uh, even if we're not very well informed. <laughs> we do want to, to have that control and not uh, relinquish that to the government. But this is something we're going to be talking about over the next five, even 10 years, and we're seeing governments make steps forward. So for example, Singapore just recently came out and said they are going to start treating the internet in their country, right, and uh, intra-country networks as basically a critical infrastructure akin to providing clean water or sanitation. It's something that's required that the government will provide. So there, and the details are fuzzy. We're not sure what that's going to mean, but the government's going to take very proactive steps to help clean and protect the internet for each of their citizens. And again, if you start looking at the bigger picture, all of the critical infrastructures nowadays have some dependency on the internet some way, somehow. So whether it's electrical power or food distribution or water, sanitation, all those, it's all now linked in. But again, there's gonna be tension in the system and it's really gonna come down to probably a lot of debates in those individual countries to figure out what the right balance for them is. We're gonna see the pendulum swing back and forth um, across the countries and across the globe, trying to hammer this out. That's the only way it's gonna happen. The only way that I can see. And I think the other aspect of that is going to be this whole tension between um, individual rights and collective benefit. And that's gonna be at the heart of a lot of these debates. Absolutely. I yeah, I, I agreed. Um, and again, if the individuals don't understand the ramifications to some of their actions, it becomes a really difficult conversation to have um, to, to get to a conclusion that everybody is or compromise that everybody accepts. It's difficult if, if people don't understand that. So I think one of the first thing that, that has to happen is awareness and education for all of us um, in this new space, this new realm especially when it comes down to what are the consequences, what are the risks, what are the best practices? Exactly. There was a recent article that highlighted the, the need for cyber ethics training already in graduate education. Uh, and that's the only way we can actually take care of the next uh, quarter century or so, because otherwise we always try to, to solve things at the back end. Well, if people were never educated in the first place, how are we gonna ever gonna put a stop to the bleeding? But I wanted to bring up one more thing because we, we, we mentioned it here and there in terms of the restricted access or restricted uh, permission to certain data. What are your thoughts on maybe having a subset of the internet for healthcare, a subset of the internet for finance, a subset of the internet for legal and voting purposes? That's another one I see a lot of people uh, completely polarized. Uh, Dr. Thomason, do you have any thoughts on that? 
if you had to pick, would you want to share the same data for healthcare as for your financial institution or for your for just voting? Well, absolutely not. And but I think I think this is where it becomes incredibly complex because one of the issues for me, if we just uh, talk about health data, is if you think about the welfare of the patient, then it's in everyone's interest that every piece of health data from sort of their entire medical history is available in one place. Because if you think about how we seek healthcare now, we might move to different countries, different states, go to different doctors, go to different hospitals. And so you never have a place where someone can look at your entire medical history and make accurate and informed judgment. So there's some benefit in that, but at the same time, in terms of then letting your health insurer see that you had you know, some sort of dubious substance abuse problems in the past or something, then that might not be information you want to be widely shared. So I think even when you're thinking about subsets of data, you're going to want to make choices about what you show your bank or what you show your doctor or what you show your insurer. Um, and, and I think that whole kind of debate between transparency, but also your right to be able to uh, exclude some of your data from other people's access um, is something we're just going to have to really debate. And I think that's why ethics is so grounding because as a society, if that's the sort of fundamental framework that we build off, then we can kind of discuss those in the context of the kind of ethical framework of the countries that we live in. And, and that is one other thing that I just wanted to raise is that there is no global set of ethics that every country will be signed on to. And so some countries are far more collectivist about the rights of the community over the rights of the individual, for example, and some are more authoritarian. And that's going to play out in the way that they view and debate ethical questions. So there's not ever going to be one size fits all in this. Mm -hmm. Matt, what are your thoughts on Internet of Everything versus a more segregated, more focused approach for various industries? Practically speaking, trying to compartmentalize data like that is impossible. So it sounds um, good in theory, but... <laughs> it, it sounds great in theory, right? I want my health data separated from my finance data or my, my family data. Okay, so first off, they're all intermingled anyway, you know, as, as Jane indicated, um, my healthcare provider also needs to know about my parents and their family history and everything else, right, and probably has my credit card on file for co-payments, and, and so there's already a commingling of it anyway, but the reality is even if we put in some hard walls, Given the amount of data and individual databases out there and the fact that we've got AI systems that can take that and then connect them, right, through inference at a very, very high accurate rate, the reality is even if you purposely separated them, there's going to be some company, some system somewhere that will easily be able to connect all of them and create an aggregated picture of you anyway. So you could spend hours a week trying to keep your data separate and in a microsecond, some database out there connects them all forever. And you, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. You really can't. Practically speaking, it just doesn't work, right? So if we get past that and go, okay, well, what can work? What limits can we put in place? And what's really the most important goal here? And I th think we've been talking about it. It's about choice. And mm -hmm. it's choice of the individual. It's choice of that, that nation or society uh, to align with their uh, cultural goals and governmental um, requirements, it comes down to that. And once you then have that for a nation, the next big challenge is how do you get more than one nation with those different standards and structures to collaborate and work together? Because which one do you respect and what limits get put in place and what, there's just a lot of complexity there. And everything's gonna change every single day with new technology, new types of data that come out. <laughs> Um, it's, it's a moving target. It's really exciting and really frustrating at the same exact time. Absolutely. I think there's a question that I'd, I'd like to again ask because if you frame it as, and I'm an individual sitting here and, and Matthew listening to you, how can I find out who's connected all that data and got the AI and sort of aggregated everything about me so that I can know what's out there on the internet? 
Right now, there's absolutely no way. And there's no regulations that require it. One of the things that I've advocated for many years, at least here in the US, I'd love to see globally, is for companies to give you a report, right? If a company has your personal data, they should be sending you a report, find an email, whatever, um, once a year and saying, hey, this is the data that we have and this is who we've shared it with. And that way you like can create a chain of custody them. on who has it and who doesn't and be able to then apply opt-in and opt-out models to say, no, I don't want this. Yes, that's okay. And again, it gives you the visibility because if you don't have visibility, you can't control it. And then you can overlay the control structures and the policies and the governmental regulations to empower people to decide where their data goes, who has it and for how long, what they're going to use it for. But right now, you have no idea. I have no idea. There are dedicated companies out there. In fact, one just did an IPO um, that gather this data, collect it, and aggregate it from multiple databases all over the globe for all different services, build an individual profile, individual profile on you, and they can determine, well, they can determine what you like, what you don't, how you'll vote, what your viewpoints are, what kind of news stories will impact you, what clicks you will link, or, or what uh, links you will click on, uh, what videos you will watch. They are building over time incredibly accurate profiles. Um, and it can be used to entice somebody to purchase an item. It can also be used to manipulate somebody's viewpoint. Mm -hmm. But we have no idea who those companies are for the most part, or governments in, the, in, you know, in, in many places that are doing that. It's a challenge. We're blind. Exactly. And so we talked a lot about the individual perspective of society, government, but from a corporation perspective, what are your thoughts on how organizations can actually mitigate? So we talked about all these uh, potential negative consequences. How, how should organizations approach this? Because if you start to think about all these negative things, then you can't do any more business, right? So on the one hand, everybody's pushing towards digital transformation, digital adoption, you know, smart cities. We're super excited to, to get the benefits of all the technologies, but how can C-suite leaders then do it right if they take into consideration all our concerns? Any thoughts on that from a corporation perspective? Yeah. I'm, I'm um, okay, go, go ahead, Jane. I, I was I was going to open on it because I think um, firstly is the issue of awareness and education because if, if a company is aware of these issues and educates its employees about the issues that's a start I think secondly what's important is some sort of framework for thinking about or considering ethical issues and I think the third thing and this goes back to the earlier point that I made about being able to have ethical decisions have an impact of such speed and scale that it can do exponential damage really quickly if they're the wrong kinds of decisions is how you particularly educate the people who are building the technology to take those ethical considerations into account when they're building this decision making processes that's in the technology and uh, Mia Matthew I'd, I'd sort of welcome you fleshing that out, but I think it's got to be purposeful. The company's got to be aware to educate people and then purposefully make decisions about how they're using technology um, and the impact of that. And as you raised, Matthew, the transparency for their customers to understand what's going on with their data. Yeah, you know, I, I can only echo what you said in reality. I think the first step is for companies to understand this is important. It's raising to the level of being a competitive advantage. So you can either lead or you can follow your, your competitors, right? And if, if you're a proactive organization, um, you really should be taking that step forward to go, okay, this is important. Um, we just kind of expect our employees to do the right thing anyway. No, it actually takes more than that, especially in this digital age, uh, given the speed, the scope, the potential impacts something more formal needs to be put in place. And so again, that then gets to, okay, how do we define what is our ethical goals? What will we do? What won't we do? And you need to be able to codify that. You have to be able to express that in a consistent and comprehensive manner. And that's where we get to the communication because once the executives and the representatives for the shareholders kind of come to an agreement, this is our ethical world. This is where we're going to play and here's our borders where we're not. 
Now that enables you to communicate that. You can communicate that both internally to your employees and contractors. You can communicate that to your vendors and suppliers and business partners. And most importantly, you can communicate that to your customers. And that's really where it gets into kind of a competitive advantage. Now, saying things, what you're going to do and not do, talk is cheap. You actually then have to put the structures in place. And this is where it comes into consistency and you need to have confidence in it. So you do need those frameworks, right? You do need, uh, typically you need experts to kind of help you build that and then interweave that into the structure of your business and your process. And that includes products. So it's got to come in at, at kind of every angle, if you will. It has to saturate through the company. And then there have to be controls in there too, to make sure that it stays alive. Ethics programs can go great on day one and then start to wither. And we've seen that, right? We see that in lots of different things. If you don't want that to happen, you have to put those controls and, and processes in place to make sure it stays alive, that there's checks and balances, that there's accountability, that there's oversight, and there's responsibility there. And those are tied to incentives to make sure everybody understands why they're doing it, how it impacts them, how it impacts their product, their reputation, their shareholders. All of that has to take place. It's not simple or easy. And especially in this digital world, it's kind of new territory for most companies, you're probably going to need help, right? Just as your cybersecurity issues, you wouldn't go off and try and do it yourself if you didn't have security pros, right? You would either hire people in or you would contract out, but you'd have to get the right expertise. And I think the same thing is here. Um, to build a good cyber program, you have to have the expertise, either in-house or contract out. So I have a, a question for all of you as well. The one that causes the biggest debate, and I always uh, laugh that I get bullets and I need a bulletproof vest or a helmet when I <laughs> have to bring it up, is purpose, brand, and people not wanting to invest in cyber ethics uh, and don't understand the consequences on their brand and their purpose. Do you have any thoughts on that? Jane, you're nodding, and then uh, we'll have Matthew give us his lessons learned <laughs> by dealing with all the companies. Look, I think this is where we need to get a lot better. One of my frustrations in talking to people about digital transformation, whether it's ethics or whether it's what the world could be like, um, if you were kind of thinking in a futuristic sense, is that people have no idea. Um, and even on the topic of cybersecurity, people have no idea, let alone cyber ethics. And so I think what we need to be much better at doing is telling the story of what's going on already in the digital world and what the future world's going to be like and therefore what we need to be thinking about. So I, I really think there's a job for us and it's more than education. It's about envisioning because you're talking to people about a world they don't know exists. But I think we've been given an incredible opportunity because of the pandemic, because the pandemic enforced a sort of immediate digitalization that would have taken years and years and years with any other circumstance. So we've been able to learn very quickly that we can work from home, we can have our children educated at home, we can socialize, we can share, we can cope in a digital world. And, and I think that that opens people's minds to a further kind of transformation of thinking, but we need to get much smarter at being able to share that thinking and share things like the consequences of not thinking about cyber ethics and drawing those kinds of stories of an example where something big and scary and exponential has happened because the guy who was doing the coding didn't think of something. Or the gal. Stories and tell them. That's exactly right. And, and it's not enough to go, the algorithm did it. Like we have to take that accountability ourselves and tell better stories. Yeah, we Matthew, have... want to share some of the lessons you've encountered and bullets you took? <laughs> yeah, yes, lots of bullets. Um, we have an axiom in cybersecurity, and it's security isn't relevant until it fails. Right? Nobody wants to invest in security until something actually bad happens, and then they're like, hey, we need to invest in security. And the, I think that equally applies to ethics. Now, the challenge there is, you know, 
building that vision and pulling people into it of what the future is so that they can see those risks ahead of time. And it's not an easy task to, to walk people down that road to where they also understand these are the relevant risks. This is what can happen. How do I mitigate those now? How can I do something small now to avoid something great that's detrimental later? Um, but it really comes down to us. We have to share the vision and we have to pull them into that so that they can see the risks. Once they see the risks and or benefits, right, because there's always opportunities when there are risks, if they can see that, now the light bulbs start coming on where they can mitigate the risks, they can take advantage of opportunities, and they can do all of these things because they have a better understanding of the path that is before us. So, you know, I, I agree with Jane. Much of our job is communicating that so that we're all looking forward, not looking back, looking forward to what needs to happen in our digital futures. So if I'm a C-suite leader that wants to do the right thing, what do you expect from me as a ethical leader that cares about cyber security? What advice would you have for me? So the advice that I would give to a C-suite is one, they have to test the waters with the rest of their C-suite. Um, because again, people have different viewpoints on what's important when it comes to ethics and what those boundaries are. But start that conversation. Every organization needs a champion. And it can be anybody, right? They can kick off that discussion. Ultimately, it needs to be a C-suite level owner that's going to drive it and make sure that it lives and breathes and carries on. But anybody can start that discussion in a company. And I would advocate any employee, whether you're emptying the trash can or whether you're a frontline manager or whether you're an executive, have that conversation because ethics is important. Now, once that happens, again, you got to figure out what those real objectives and goals are and then assemble the right team to actually make it into something that uh, is, is a framework that will stay and live on and create those guardrails to make sure you're not bouncing out. And that leads back to the, the comprehensiveness and consistency over time. But it takes a voice and you have to have the goals. And one of the goals that you should absolutely have as a company is on your website. Right now you already have a privacy policy. You already talk about how you're gonna handle data and there's ethics weaved into that. Right? What we're going to see in the future with the most forward thinking companies is right next to that privacy policy link, you're going to see an ethics policy link. And that's where it's going to talk about their commitment to ethical behavior and handling data and securing products and taking responsibility and showing transparency and their commitment as a company and some of those boundaries. Right? And that becomes something that they can be held accountable to. That's what we're so going to see. So should we maybe have, like you said, for individuals where you would get an itemized report per year, also companies to have to post them? I would uh, love audits, that. I've been right? <laughs> I, 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 I really, really want that because then I can hold accountable and we can actually start tracking down the companies that are violating um, the mm -hmm. privacy regulations and rules and are doing things unethical and we can call them out. Right now, it's just a, a cloud and you don't know who to point the finger to. And if you, there's no accountability, the people that are doing bad things will continue to do them. They're getting away with it. I think too, what would be really useful is, you know, if we could find a way to look at international frameworks that exist. And I was just thinking about environment, social and governance, because when people are thinking about like good companies that have the, the welfare of the planet and people in their heart, their ESG companies, but maybe we, we need to think of a way to add another E to some of these global frameworks, global reporting initiative, for example, and get those ethical frameworks embedded in those because we can do it on a company by company basis, but that's a huge job. So there are these kind of global frameworks that exist that have a gap in terms of cyber ethics. And maybe that's where people like us can help to make a contribution, put, put some ideas on the table about where those frameworks are wanting and what could be added in terms of ethical considerations around data management, data analytics, and data customization and how outcomes are used. Yeah, the consistency across borders is going to have to be there eventually. I mean, we have to get to that point. Um, 
and so it, it's going to require international kind of agreements, even if it's just something basic, right, to make sure that you, you know, you do have an ethical stance or there is somebody accountable for whatever your ethics are. Um, but it's got to start somewhere. Otherwise, it just doesn't become scalable. And, and you're, you're, you, there's going to be too many gaps and too many holes. And that's just too much of a detriment to everyone. So we're, we're coming to an end of our uh, virtual roundtable. Dr. Thomason, would you like to say any closing remarks as to what you're hoping for the future and what we can work towards as a global society? I'm really excited that we're starting the conversation. I think where the, where the challenge will come will be first identifying where those places are that it's important that ethical considerations are built into the fabric of any business um, isn't going to be the difficult thing. I think the difficult thing is ensuring when people are building the technology and building the algorithms and considering the data sets that they're used, that these flow through into the entire kind of digital business of a company. So I think it's very complicated. I think there's a lot of work to be done, but starting the conversation now, starting that kind of education, alerting people to the fact that cybersecurity and cyber ethics are going to have to be on the strategic plan of every company in the world is something that's an important starting point. Wonderful. Well, I hope our audience enjoyed our conversation. I think we touched on a lot of uh, super complex topics, such as digital identity, privacy, how can we mitigate some of the risks? What opportunities do we have if we want to not only do a good cyber ethics program, but also have purpose and impact globally? And I wanted to share with our audience that we're going to touch on some of these things in our future events. So our next one will be only on informed consent in the digital era. Then we're going to have also a one session only on data governance with Dr. Blackman. And in the future ones, we'll touch on some of the emerging technologies such as quantum, blockchain, artificial intelligence that are causing quite a lot of attention and definitely a lot of headaches to cyber ethics specialists. <laughs> so uh, I want to thank you all again for participating today. And I want to welcome our audience to stay tuned for future sessions. Thank you so much. Stay tuned for Thank information. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.